I mean, I guess this is probably the most honest video I've ever made. Saying that feels a bit weird because it feels like uh, somehow I'm suggesting my other videos aren't honest or anything like that. But you know, it's, it's you and me. I'm literally staring down the barrel of the lens and I wanna tell you about after 12 years in Spain, what my life is like, the good, the bad, and the ugly. I recently made a video where I went to Valencia and spoke to some people who had moved to Valencia in the last you know, year or so. They were all having a great time. Yeah, there were challenges, but there wasn't really dramatic challenges for them in the move, which made me reflect on my time here. They were clearly still in their honeymoon period. I've been here for 12 years. I am well outside the honeymoon period. What comes after? the honeymoon period? What are the phases that I've gone through? What, what is my life like when you've taken off those rose tinted glasses when you move to Spain or you move to any new place that you have a dream to go and live in? So I've thought about my life in terms of buckets, right? First one I wanna tackle is, is relationship. As many of you know, I'm married to Yoli. We met in France uh, a million years ago. Well, it was probably like, I think 2005, 2006. I always get it wrong. Yoli always corrects me. Then we moved to Spain for about six months, then New Zealand for about five years, and then we came back here 12 years ago. Our relationship has, and I assume will continue to work out. I have seen friends, uh, met two male friends who have married women from another country, not from New Zealand. And in both cases, they had kids and got divorced. Both these friends are now living outside of New Zealand. They would rather live in New Zealand, but they can't leave the country they're in, you know, whether it's Spain or the UK, because they have kids there. That's where their family is and they can't take their kids. I feel lucky that it's all looking good for the moment in terms of our, in terms of our relationship. But having said that, when you, I mean, any relationship goes through phases, right? But when you move countries, uh, in one case we met in a country that neither of us were from. In the next case, we moved to New Zealand, pretty much where I'm from, and then we moved to Spain where Yoli's from, has given me an interesting perspective on what it's like to live both as two foreigners in a place, but also in your spouse's country, and also have your spouse in, in your country. We kind of had all three combinations. And why I say this is because I think it's important to realize that if you're in an international relationship in a place, if one of you is from that place, then the other is really gonna rely on you, for a period anyway, and it depends a little bit on the language. And that can, it doesn't necessarily create f friction, but it can be disempowering for that person. And so I think you have to be ready for to have a lot of trust, to be able to lean on each other. We were in New Zealand, I felt empowered. And you can kind of look at Yoli and feel like, oh, poor thing, she feels a little bit lost, right? And that's hard to see the person you love feeling a little bit lost, and then it flips. And we're here and I feel a little bit lost and I have to lean on Yoli. So and I think in those relationships, you, when you're in those situations, you need a lot of trust. So if you're in an international relationship moving to wherever, you need to have a lot of trust that you know that it's gonna, it's gonna shift your roles in the relationship. But I think the biggest challenge in an international relationship is when you have kids together, right? Whether neither of you from that country or one of you are. We have a two-year-old, almost two-year-old daughter, Lucia. She's wonderful, she's beautiful. Uh, <laughs> you can see my, my face, you know, she is the, you know, she's just a total joy. Spain is a good place to bring up kids, from what I can tell. This is a country where community is important, where people love kids, waiters love kids. That just makes it easier, right? You're not a burden when you're out with your child. Access to nature is pretty easy here. Healthcare is paid for through your taxes, not expensive in terms of out-of-pocket expenses to just have a baby. And so I think that in so many ways, my experience is this is a, this is a wonderful, place to have a child. You know, talking about people who do take my Move to Spain Masterclass, a lot of them are from the United States, and if they're coming with kids, more and more in every cohort, I see gun violence, as mentioned. What I feel fortunate here is, this feels like a safe place to bring up a child. This feels like a, a place where I don't have fear for her, for her future, but there is a but here. And this isn't something that I expected. When you have a, a child in a country where one of the people isn't from there, immediately your support network in terms of family is cut in half, right? I see people who are from here, you know, they're both Spaniards and they have kind of four babysitters and four family members in terms of the grandparents, if they're all still alive, around all the time, particularly if they, you know, if they live nearby and I think, wow, that would be amazing. Obviously my parents are in New Zealand. Yoli's parents also actually live kind of far away. They don't, they don't have a car. They can't sort of come and just sort of babysit that easily. So in a way we do actually live the experiences of neither of us are from here. We've only just gone out for our first evening in 
two years. We got a babysitter, now we have a relationship with the babysitter, it's going well, but my God, not having that support as, as a parent uh, from family in the early years makes it, you know, challenging. You know, your relationship becomes completely about parenting and you lose an aspect of, of your own relationship, right? So going back to Luthia, there's one thing that I miss a little bit based on where we live, and that is her access, and as a family, our access to nature. Now, it's easy to jump on a train, it's cheap to get on, you know, go up into the, the mountains of the north of Madrid and explore and things like that. But I grew up in New Zealand where I would disappear in the morning, be playing in the bush with my friends and come back for lunch or dinner. We take her to New Zealand, I can just see, you know, walking on grass and things like that, she, the beach just down the road. And I think that raises another thing. Luthia has a Spanish passport, a New Zealand passport. When we were there in New Zealand last, I was like, I had this feeling, this overwhelming feeling. I don't want New Zealand for her to be just like this place she visits the odd Christmas. I want her to feel that identity, not just have the passport. It's so far away in New Zealand that I don't know, you know, the time, the expense to travel there. I don't know how we achieve that. It's it's kind of like this thing that's in my mind. How do we do that? You know, and obviously a big part of having a children is your, your experience of the healthcare system. We went through and we remain in the public system. We don't have private health healthcare. It's been good. It's been fine. Yoli was well looked after in all stages. Luthia has been well looked after. With some caveats, I will say, is that the health system in Spain, the public health system, is a little rough around the edges at the time. You, you get a sense that the doctor is a little rushed. Sometimes you need a little bit of time, right, to ask your questions and, and go through things. And how it works here is you've got to get your family doctor, then they refer you to the specialist. You can't go straight to the specialist. If you were the private care, you could go straight to the specialist. So recently, I had like this eczema thing. I was like itchy, probably anxiety, <laughs> which I suffer from sometimes. and. I was like, you know what, I don't want to go to my doctor and then explain that and then get the appointment for the next doctor or the specialist. And so I made an appointment, not, we don't, again, we don't have private health insurance, but I just made a direct private doctor, dermatologist appointment. And so I see a little bit of me wondering, will we have as a family or, or personally, will we have private healthcare in the future? Will we pay for private healthcare in the future? There's some people who say in Spain that if you have the money, you should pay for private healthcare and leave the public healthcare resources for those who can't afford to pay for private. I think that's a specious argument because then suddenly what you have is healthcare for the poor and healthcare for the rich. And I think the more of us who demand quality healthcare, regardless of what we earn from the public system, then you keep pressure on the public system, right? To say, this is what should be provided for. It's like. But at the same time, are you gonna sacrifice that for your health if you're worried about something? So I've done a big health deep dive here, which I didn't intend to. One thing I did wanna say though, is that if you are looking at having a baby in Spain and you're not fluent uh, in Spanish or neither of you are, I can imagine that would be quite stressful. That would be quite challenging because if you don't understand stuff, it's a little, it's a little rough around the edges, the public system, and you may not have an English speaking doctor. You may not even have a private English speaking doctor to go through the private system, but at least you will have, you paid money. You can tell them to slow down. You can tell them to wait. <laughs> they got to listen, right? It's different. It just feels different. So I would, if I didn't have really strong Spanish skills and I was looking at, you know, you know, having a pediatric, pediatric care or, you know, having a baby, I would look personally at the private system. So another area, a huge part of my life obviously is my work, my, my professional life. You know, in the 12 years I've been more freelance or, or running my own business than being an employee. That feels like a place where often salaries are low, there is high unemployment, there's not been great relationship, labor relationships between bosses and employees. And so when people are looking at, you know, moving over here and they're wondering about, you know, can I get a job? Can I get a job without speaking Spanish? Yeah, okay, maybe in an international company, there's an opportunity, but having Spanish is always gonna help you. Where they earn more for what they do than they will earn in Spain. Yeah, it's cheaper to live in Spain than those countries, but the salary drop is often quite significant. So my experience has always been to start my own company, start my own thing. I've had a pretty good run of it, I think. Uh, it's gone through phases. I started as a freelancer writer and guide, then I was running and owning Devour Tours, and now I'm 100% you know, focused on running and uh, owning Spain Revealed, which is the YouTube channel, also the course, and my Madrid Revealed ebook, and you know, various other bits and pieces. People often ask, okay, being an entrepreneur, what's that like? Are the taxes and the bureaucracy a nightmare and all those things. I think what I'll say for that, well, first of all, I love what I do, right? I have, through a mixture of luck and I guess some smarts, chosen to dedicate myself to industries or things that I do that both I enjoy, but although there's like 
people are willing to pay for those things, whether it's a food tour or people want to relocate to Spain and want your help. So I feel fortunate for on that side of things. And that's made it a lot easier to swallow some of the bureaucratic stuff you have to deal with and things like that. But before I forget, I think one other thing that has I feel fortunate around the, the entrepreneurial and the professional side of my life is that the people who I earn money from, whether they watch a YouTube video and I get some ad revenue or whether they buy my course, are people who come from cultures that are similar to mine, broadly speaking. And so I understand them, I understand their needs, you know, whether it's someone from Australia, New Zealand, UK, Canada, I kind of get you guys, right? So if you're looking at coming to Spain, and you want to start working as an entrepreneur, before you worry about the taxes and the bureaucracy, all that stuff's necessary, right? I think, think about what am I going to offer uh, and who am I going to offer it to? And can I earn enough so that I don't feel ground down by all the taxes and the social security payments and things like that, that I'm living on the edge. So red tape, what's that like? Keep in mind that the businesses that I have always run have had a big online component. Spain Revealed is 100% online. I don't sit in front of, I don't give tours or anything like that. Now, Devour is uh, obviously an online brand, but the actual giving the, the, the tours happens in the street. And I, you know, I loved giving tours, but you know, still a lot of it was really online, particularly in the beginning stages. It was just, you know, it wasn't a big team or anything. It was just kind of us building it up. So generally I haven't found it too hard. I recently made Spain Revealed a company, right? So I went through the company, the process of starting a company, which in New Zealand is like you go online, you just choose your name, you do it, it's so easy. I think that maybe just because there's an ingrained thinking about how things should be done in Spain and that if it's like starting a company, you gotta get all the people involved, you gotta get all the things signed, it's gotta be all sort of official and things like that. But for example, when I started this company, to get the constitution done, it had to go through a notary, which is a, a kind of an official legal type person here to, to write the constitution. They got it wrong four times. They kept sending it back and then the company's office would reject it. It's like, really? Is it that hard? It's like a nightmare. So if we talk, think about buckets of life, another big bucket is community and friendships. And I know this is an area that people really struggle with when they move to a new country. I've been here 12 years and for the first 10, really, I was a workaholic. I kind of still am a workaholic and I something I, I struggle with. So obviously working, I didn't have time to to build uh, a community and focus on that. And the other thing is I moved here when I was about 32 years old. You've passed that moment in life where you formed those, you know, those school friends, those university friends that are those core friends that, that you have. When I go back to New Zealand and I see my friends that I went to university with, that I flattered with, it's like slipping on an old sock. You know, the, the, the old jokes come back, the, the, the references to movies we watched in those formative years. And it's amazing and I really miss that. You know, and I think people used to talk about the blue zone or whatever that area is called where people live forever, right? And they're like, oh, it's the red wine. It's the lack of red meat. Yeah, okay, it's community. And that is an area that I have not dedicated the time I should have in the last 10 years. And now I'm trying to change that. And so my friends here are, I have sort of English speaking friends that I hang out with, a lot of journalists and things like that. And we're great friends. We have a great time together. And then the other side I have are Yoli's friends that I acquired when I moved here. I feel a little ashamed or regretful that I don't have more one-on-one, -on -one, like they're my friends, Spanish friends. You know, when you live in a place and you have, say, a lot of friendships in English, it can make you feel like a little bit of an outsider. And I know I'm supposed to be the ultimate insider, but it's there. Sometimes with Spaniards, because I just can't be as quick on my feet or, or I don't feel like I represent who I am completely in my language, I'm not as funny in Spanish as I am in English, um, feel like a bit of a burden in some of those situations or relationships. So you shy away from that a little bit. It's time for me to get over that. So literally as of six months ago, you know, I'm a very list driven person. I have a recurring item in my to-do list. Every Friday, I have a checklist item called friends in which I look to the week forward and it's like, have I got stuff set up with friends? This is me trying to build that community muscle, trying to live my blue zone and, 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 and extend my life, uh, which you know I've realized that less red wine, more friends is probably the answer to that. So someone asked me when I said I was preparing this video, what my biggest challenge is living in Spain. That biggest challenge and kind of my biggest regret is how I've treated my Spanish learning. When I moved here, I sort of just figured, okay, I'll learn it through osmosis. Of course, I'm in a relationship with a Spaniard. And I did a lot of it, you know, leading tours and busy tapas bars and talking to the vendors, like I have a good level of Spanish. And I think generally I'm pretty good at languages. So, so I've been able to, 
to pick it up. But there's like gaps in my knowledge because I've never actually studied Spanish and I regret not doing that. I think in the first three or four years, it's like, hey, I'm learning Spanish, it's okay. My Spanish doesn't have to be great, I'm new here. You know, after 10, 11, 12 years, you're like, you kind of should have a higher level. About a year ago, I started going to a tutor. Apps like Duolingo are great tools, right? But they're not a study plan. They, they're kind of like just spokes in the wheel. But the hub, the thing in the middle is actually a teacher. You need a teacher whether you go to class or whether you have a one-on-one -on -one tutor, whatever it is. So when going to my tutor, it's like, hey, I told her, it was like therapy in a way. I was like, this is how I feel after 11 years in Spain at the time. This is how I feel about my language. And these are the areas I'm, I know I'm weak in. And we just hammer those and we nail those. And it's great. And I, my confidence is rising. My goal is not to be fluent. Lucia will be fluent in Spanish. Her Spanish will be better than me, probably by like, seven. <laughs> You're never going to become fluent. 100%. I'll never speak like Yoli or like Luthia will. It's not my objective. My objective is to be able to be who I want to be and live the life I want to live in Spain in Spanish, right? So let's look to kind of like the future. How do I feel about the future? I mean, I feel good about the future. I'm, I'm, I feel like life is good, except there is one thing I do worry about and that's climate change. That is something that causes me not like I'm f my, my skin is itchy anxiety, not that level, but it's just there. Water usage is an issue here and how that's managed. And after last June, July, where there was the heat waves and you know, we just had a baby and, and you know, you can't go out after 8 p.m. because the baby's in bed. So that's often when you go out in the evening because it's cooler. We were just, tra we felt like trapped in our house for like a month. This August, we've rented a house in Galicia in the north for the whole month. It's like a climate change driven decision. That's where we want to go. We don't want to be suffocating. And so we're going up there and I wonder what that will be like. You know, the North reminds me of New Zealand. Yoli's always been somebody who wants to travel South. And I've been like, I kind of like the North of her. It's a little cool, a little cold, particularly in winter. But I'm like, what would that like look like in the future? Might we decide to move North at some point? Which I think then brings up another question of, are we going to stay in Madrid? Sometimes people ask me if I would move back to New Zealand and no, I wouldn't. I feel at home in Spain. I've always felt at home. It just always felt right people, the friendliness, the gregariousness of the culture, the, the history, the food, the way we eat, the way we socialize, it suits my personality. So no, we wouldn't move back to New Zealand, but as I say, it's important for me to have that as a big part of Luthia's life. So what that looks like going forward, I don't, I don't know. And, and weighing on my mind, and this is for people who are looking at obviously moving countries, is that I have family in New Zealand. My parents are there, my parents are there, obviously they're getting older. My brother is, is in London, my sister is in New Zealand with her family. So I don't really have any family around me and I miss that. But but I wouldn't change it. So it's like the thing that you give up to live in the place that I want to live. Would we move out of Madrid? I have always had a bit of a conflicted feeling about Madrid. I love Madrid that it's a big city. I love that it's in the center of the country. If you're fascinated by Spain, you can get anywhere, right? You're right in the middle. There's great connections with trains. You can taste food from all over the country here. But you know, that lack of, you know, we live in a pretty urban neighborhood. There's not a lot of green space in this neighborhood that we live in. So Yoli and I sometimes wonder, or I wonder, you know, out loud in front of Yoli, would we move to a smaller place in the north? Or, you know, I know we've kind of joked about moving to Galiz, but you know, what will this August be like in Galicia? Would we move some, I would kind of love to live in a smaller place for a while, but I think on balance, you know, it is the best place in Spain for us right now. So coming back to that point of the honeymoon period that uh, the people in the Val Valencia video I made were still in, am I still in the honeymoon period? Well, yes and no in a way. One of the things I feel grateful for about my life in Spain is that my job is to be curious about this country. It's always been to learn about its food and, and make videos about interesting festivals and meet people. It's like I'm always learning different aspects of, of Spain uh, and discovering new layers. And that has kept me in a sort of perpetual honeymoon phase. If you wanna remain in that honeymoon period, try and keep curious, keep discovering, keep, don't, you know, keep discovering new aspects of the country, keep exploring. So I feel like I have a lifetime of exploration still to do that Spain provides me and that I'm, you know, I'm excited for. But as I think about that, I realize that maybe that's like a key to, to life and leading a happy life. Even if you're in your own country, your own city, like not just keep, keep exploring, like stay in the honeymoon period. Uh, 
regardless of where you are. So guys, that's just one guy's perspective of his 12 years. Uh, let me know if you live in Spain or, you know, I don't know, give me, give me your thoughts below. I'm curious how this video was. I hope I haven't really been boring. And also, if you are curious about moving to Spain, I, I know I've referred a few times to this course, the Move to Spain Masterclass I run. I'll link down below and I'll link it just for a limited time, a replay of the webinar I recently gave uh, gave about the seven secrets to a successful move to Spain. Things I've learned that, that that make for a successful move. And yeah, would you be interested in more videos where I sit down and kind of tell you about life in Spain, this sort of thing? I know Yoli and I used to do more videos together. That was hard uh, without sort of childcare. Maybe we can do some more videos together as well in this, in this format. So if you're curious about this stuff, let us know in the comments. And something I also wanted to say is that I would love to interview more people who have lived in Spain for for you know a longer period who've come from somewhere else and moved here and lived here for say five years or more if you're you're leading a life that you think might be interesting to share with the spain revealed audience uh, then i'll put some details below about how you can how you can get in touch with me apart from that uh thanks for watching and uh we'll see you in the next episode which won't be in this room uh, i'll promise to reveal uh more interesting parts of spain <laughs>